All right, so what are embeddings? Well, if we look at this picture, it carries a lot of meaning for us humans, but that's only when we see it like this. You know, if we drill down and look more closely and then look more closely still, it's just a long list of pixels described by color. And if you look even closer yet, eventually you'll find that it's just zeros and ones. And those aren't meaningful to you and me, but it's the machine's representation of a moment in time captured visually. And that's not unlike an embedding. An embedding is a transformation from inputs, which could be anything from audio clips to text to images, into a machine representation of that data that's meaningful to deep learning algorithms. So this representation is called an embedding because it's a subset of the input data. It's an understanding of that data that's as complex and rich as the model that made it. And the embedding is represented as a vector, which is to say an array of numbers, or sometimes a series of vectors. For example, if we take a text document, we might divide it up into sentences and then having an embedding representing the meaning of each sentence or even of each word. And depending on the model, these can have different dimensionality. So the number of elements in the array could range from a handful to thousands. And while embeddings are the internal data structure of deep learning algorithms, they can also be the outputs, which is how most of us not creating these systems, but simply using them will interface with embeddings. So you pass some data input to a model and the model transforms it into something that it can natively understand. That's the vector embedding. And sometimes it behooves us to store off this representation of the data. A model is trained from data sets, and you can think of it as like a condensed set of knowledge in a decision center. Like our brains, it's what evaluates inputs and converts noise and color and light into impressions of meaning and reduces those to the important elements to be saved and remembered. Well, in some cases, it does make sense to retain those impressions by capturing the embeddings and then storing them. You could think of this as the memory of AI systems. It's separate and used differently from the training sets, though they can be fed back in for training or for context or for other things. But fundamentally, embeddings that you pull out are, become memory for the system. And the place where the memory is stored these days is in a vector database. There's quite a few sprouting up these days and lots of funding flowing to them from Pinecone to Weaviate to Chroma, Qdrint, Milvis, and more. And they don't just store these vectors of numbers, but they allow you to draw connections between them to understand them and to mine them. The main and the most important operations you can do on these vectors is to compare them to each other to see which ones are similar, to learn how similar they are, to find clusters of similar embeddings, think of like finding similar memories and so forth. This is done with a bunch of different math techniques that evaluate these differences in different ways with different trade-offs for performance and accuracy and, and what they optimize for. So that when those operations are used in practice for a lot of purposes, Companies like Spotify and YouTube use embeddings to power recommendation systems. Pinterest uses them to power a visual search where they find images similar to one that you upload. Netflix uses embeddings to predict what people want and what new shows to make for them. And Google has started to dabble in semantic search. So one use case, use case for finding similar vectors is a similarity search or when applied to text data, what we call a semantic search. Regular search leans heavily on keywords but semantic searches take words together with their contexts to better understand their meaning like we do. So consider the word arms. As a keyword, it's somewhat useless because it's ambiguous. I could be talking about the thing that hangs off of torsos or I could be talking about weapons. Or then again, I could be talking about arming myself with knowledge and using it as a verb. And beyond discerning word meanings, it understands word and even sentence and document relatedness. So for words, for example, the word fly might be related to airplane, it might also be related to bird, but airplane and bird are much less related to each other directly. But bird could be related to the word pet and so also the context of pet would be related to dog and cat. And you see how these connections work in these neural networks, especially these large language models. So similarity searches are a major use case, but any kind of data that can be represented, uh, and basically anything can that has a model that's been trained on it, um, 
can, can do lots of things with that data. Embeddings are used for face and voice recognition. They're used for the generative AI, prediction engines, personalization, the Q&A chat stuff, especially for remembering the history of the chat, and much, much more. Just beware that data represented as embeddings may be sensitive if the input is. So if you feed in, let's say, your sensitive corporate strategy, the fact that it's captured and stored as a bunch of numbers doesn't mean someone couldn't query it to ask what new projects are planned, what revenue forecasts are, etc. If the input went through a large language model to produce the embedding, you could actually ask for the entire document to be recreated. And it would use different words, sure, but it would contain the same content and the same meaning. Same goes for images and so forth. So anyway, I hope that helps you to better understand embeddings and their use cases um, in case they start cropping up in your work or your day-to-day. -day.